In the last lesson, we looked at the basic perceptron algorithm, and now we're going to look at the multi-layer perceptron. Multi-layer perceptrons are simply networks of perceptrons, networks of linear classifiers. And they have an input layer, uh, some hidden layers perhaps, and an output layer. So if we just look at the picture on the, uh, the lower left, uh, the green nodes are input nodes. And this is actually for the numeric weather data. And although you probably can't read the labels, the top one is uh, Outlook equals sunny, underneath is Outlook equals overcast, then Outlook equals rainy, and then we have uh, temperature, humidity, and windy for the nodes. So the, this is the numeric weather data, so Outlook is the only nominal variable, and that's been uh, made into three binary variables, three binary attributes. And these two nodes are the output nodes, the yellow ones are the output nodes um, for uh, output is play and or don't play respectively. And those two yellow nodes, each of those performs a weighted sum and each of the connections has a weight. If we look at the more complicated picture to the right, then we've got some red nodes here. These are three hidden layers with different numbers of neurons of nodes in each of these three hidden layers. So each node performs a weighted sum of its inputs and thresholds the results, just like in the regular basic perceptron. But in the basic perceptron, you look to see whether the result is greater than zero or less than zero. And uh, in multi-layer perceptrons, instead of using that kind of hard-edged function, uh, people use what's called a sigmoid function. I've drawn a few sigmoid functions on the slide up in the top right. And you can see that as they become more extreme, then they approach the step function, which corresponds to the hard-edged threshold used in the basic perceptron. But here we're going to use a, a, a smooth kind of continuous uh, sigmoid function. Actually, there's a theoretical pro property that the a network will converge if the sigmoid function is differentiable. That's kind of important. But anyway, that's by the by. Uh, and these nodes are often called neurons, the red nodes and the yellow nodes. And these are not to be confused with the neurons that you have in your head. So the big questions are how many layers and how many nodes in each? We, we know for the input layer we're going to have one for each attribute, and the attributes are numeric or binary. For the output layer, we're going to have one for each class. And how many hidden layers? Well, that's up to you. If you have zero hidden layers, that's a standard perceptron algorithm, and that's suitable if the data is linearly separable. There are theoretical results with one hidden layer, that's suitable for a single convex region of the decision space, and two hidden layers are enough to generate arbitrary decision boundaries. However, people don't necessarily use two hidden layers uh, because that really increases the number of connections, that is the number of weights that have to be learnt. And the next big question is, how big should the hidden layers be? They're usually chosen somewhere between the input and output layers, and a common heuristic, Weka's heuristic, is to use the mean value of the input and output layers. And what are these weights? Well, they're learned. They're learned from the training set. They're learned by iteratively minimizing the error using the steepest descent method, and the gradient is determined using a backpropagation algorithm. We're not going to talk about the backpropagation here. But the change in weight is computed by multiplying the gradient by a constant called the learning rate, and adding the previous change in weight multiplied by another parameter called momentum. So W next, the next weight vector, is W plus delta W, where delta W is minus the learning rate times the gradient, minus uh, because we want to go downhill, plus the momentum times the previous change in uh, the weight parameter. Multilayer perceptrons can get excellent results, but they often involve a lot of experimentation with the number and size of the hidden layers and the value of the learning rate and momentum parameters. Let's take a look in Weka. I'm going to use the numeric uh, weather data. Over here, I've got it open, and I'm going to go to classify and find multilayer perceptron in the functions category. Here it is, and let's just run it. And we get 79%. I just want to show you the network we used. Uh, let me just uh, switch on GUI, the graphical user interface. And now, when I run it, I get a picture of the network. And that is Weka's default network. These are the input nodes that we looked at before, the green ones. 
and the Weka has chosen four uh, um, nodes, four neurons in the hidden layer. That's the average of the number of input and output layers, and there's uh, two two output neurons. Okay, uh, so going back to the slide, when I tried uh, IBK, also gets seventy nine percent on this uh, data set and J48 and so on do worse. However, it's just a toy problem, so those results aren't really indicative. One real problem is multilayer perceptrons often do quite well, but they're slow. And there's a number of parameters, the number of uh, hidden layers and the size of the hidden layers, the learning rate, the momentum. Uh, the algorithm makes multiple passes through the data, and training continues until the error on the validation set consistently increases, that is we start going uphill or the training time has exceeded the maximum number of epochs allowed. So going back to Weka, I'm going to configure this to use 5 neurons, 10 neurons and 20 neurons in three hidden layers. And look at this. You can see the three hidden layers with 5, 10, and 20 neurons, an awful lot of weights here. Uh, we've got uh, the learning rates, so we can change the momentum. We've got the uh, maximum number of epochs, and um, we can just run that. Also, in Weka, you can create your own network structure. You can add new nodes and add connections and delete nodes and so on. So I'm going to go back to Weka, and uh, I'm going to just use... Uh, the default number of hidden layers here. So I've now got my four neurons in the one hidden layer. I'm going to add another hidden layer. If I click empty space, I create a neuron. And uh, it's yellow, which means it's selected. I'm going to deselect it by clicking in empty space and create another couple. And with this uh, one here, I'm going to connect it up to this. If I click these, they connect the selected neuron, that is the yellow one, to the one I click. Then I can deselect it and select this one and make connections here. You can see it's pretty quick to add connections. So I've added another kind of hidden layer. Well, I need to do some things with the output here, but you can see you can get the idea from this. So we can click to select a node and right click in empty space to deselect. We can create and delete nodes by clicking in empty space to create and right clicking to delete and we can create and delete connections and we can set parameters in this interface too. Are they any good? Well, I tried the experimental with six data sets and I used nine algorithms and uh, the multilayer perceptron uh, gave me best results on two of the six data sets. And the other wins were the SMO, one on another two data sets, J48 and IBK, one on one data set each. When I say win, I mean beat all the other methods. So multilayer perceptron was not too bad, but in fact it was 10, between 10 and 2,000 times slower than the other methods, which is a bit of a disadvantage. So here's a summary. Multilayer perceptrons can implement arbitrary decision boundaries given two or more hidden layers, providing you've got enough neurons in the hidden layers, and providing they're trained properly. Training is done by backpropagation, uh, which is an iterative algorithm based on gradient descent. And in practice, you get quite good performance, but extremely slow. Multilayer perceptrons are extremely slow. Oh, I'm still not a fan of multilayer perceptrons, I'm sorry about that. I mean, they might be uh, a lot more impressive on more complex data sets, uh, I don't know. But for me, configuring multilayer perceptrons involves too much messing around. But you're going to be doing that in the activity associated with this lesson, so uh, have fun with that, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Bye for now.